Hey everyone, thanks for coming back. This past week was pretty quiet, which represents another type of a typical week in the life of Artemis news reporting. After the flurry of budget and workforce news, oversight meetings, and audit reports on Artemis at the end of April and beginning of May, there wasn't much published this week, and we're still waiting for responses to all the questions about the current status of planning and preparations. We're still monitoring the news feed every day, but looking ahead, it's probably going to be summertime here in the U.S. before we get a little bit of clarity. We'll see, but in the meantime, there are a few of these rabbit holes to dive into for a few minutes. The Orion Base Heat Shield root cause investigation continues to make news as NASA moves through the phases of the process. Artemis 1 was the second Orion test flight and the first to fly from the Earth to the Moon and back. The design of the Avcoat base heat shield was flying its first re-entry on Artemis 1, and NASA saw unexpected liberation of some of the ablative material during the re-entry to Earth on December 11, 2022. An independent review board will review the results of the internal NASA investigation, and this past week, Marsha Smith with SpacePolicyOnline.com reported that Paul Hill will head the board. Mr. Hill is currently a member of the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, or ASAP, who had a long career in the Mission Operations Directorate at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, including serving as a Space Shuttle and International Space Station Flight Director within MOD, and also serving as the Director of MOD. The independent review effort was made public in NASA's response to an audit report by the agency's Office of Inspector General. The report was published on May 1st, but the response was dated April 19th. Now that the independent review effort is underway, I asked NASA Public Affairs this last week to confirm that some of these actions that the response laid out were completed. I'm still waiting to hear back, but in the interim, we can again review what that part of the response to OIG from ESDMD head Catherine Kerner said. Quote, the team is currently synthesizing the test results together with the leading theory for root cause and are planning formal presentations to the necessary technical forums in preparation for a recommendation to the Orion Program Control Board for Artemis II in the April-May timeframe. The recommendation will include Artemis II heat shield operational capabilities based on the latest thermal analysis work. An independent review team effort planned for May 2024 will confirm the team's recommendations to the program on the root cause, heat shield capability, and corrective actions going forward." Unquote. If the review team is being named, then it's likely that the internal root cause investigation has already made its presentations to the internal technical forums and that it has also made its recommendations to the Orion program. NASA is now saying that the review will be completed, quote, this summer, unquote. The estimated completion date in the OIG report was the end of June, which is only six weeks or so away. A footnote about the crew module service module separation bolt issue. It was mentioned in the fiscal year 2025 president's budget request documentation. The Congressional Justification Document, the full request, lists it with some of the other issues that NASA had provided some explanation for. That wasn't released until mid-March of this year, though, and the recent OIG report was still the first place to provide any explanation of the issue at all. Exploration Ground Systems provided a short update on one of the verification and validation tests going on between Mobile Launcher 1 and the LaunchPad 39B area systems. The social media update posted on May 16th said that liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen were flowed from storage spheres on the edge of the Pad 39B infield through the cross-country lines and into the Mobile Launcher 1 plumbing that feeds the two SLS liquid propellant stages, the core stage and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, or ICPS. It also said a second liquid hydrogen sphere would be tested in the future, but it didn't specify which one was which. NASA finished construction of a larger second LH2 sphere at Pad 39B to support the needs of the Block 1B vehicle. However, the second sphere will also improve launch availability for the Block 1 SLS vehicle, beginning with Artemis 2. Back in January, I interviewed Cliff Lanham, 
who is the Senior Vehicle Operations Manager for NASA EGS. At the time, he said this cryo flow test was ISVV4, ISVV being Integrated Systems Verification and Validation. He also provided more details, one of which was that the work was still ongoing to repair corrosion in some of the lines and vents at the pad. The contingency plan at the time, in case that repair work wouldn't be complete before the mobile launcher was needed back in the VAB, was to do the test in the early to mid-spring time frame using the original pad sphere. But also at the time, he said that the new larger capacity sphere was going to be used to load the vehicle and that the old sphere would be used for replenishment, which doesn't sync with the social media post very well, which is why I asked for clarification right after the post was made. As is the theme nowadays, we were still waiting for a response when the work week ended. This is another step towards completing the multi-element verification and validation tests between the ML and the PAD39B systems. We can see this PAO graphic, which numbers the ISVV tests differently. I asked for updates on the emergency egress system tests and swing tests of the crew access arm, which will be an active swing arm as crewed Orion SLS missions begin with Artemis II. As of now, the big picture is that the mobile launcher is planned to roll off Pad 39B and back to the vehicle assembly building. It will roll into High Bay 3, where it will be prepped to begin stacking the Artemis 2 vehicle, beginning with the SLS solid rocket boosters. The timing of those bigger downstream Artemis 2 milestones is still to be determined or to be announced, but that end of spring, beginning of summer time frame at the end of June, beginning of July is the next one to watch for the next milestones. It's possible we'll see ML1 roll back to the VAB in that time frame, and that we'll see the Artemis II Orion spacecraft move back into the altitude chamber, this time for vacuum testing. That's about six weeks away. The plan for those two milestones has been public for a while. It's the ones after that, we will have to continue watching and waiting for as the second half of the year continues. Stacking the boosters on the mobile launcher and delivery of the rest of the SLS hardware to Kennedy Space Center, first the core stage, but also the launch vehicle stage adapter and Orion stage adapter. The timing of those deliveries may depend on more clarity about the Orion schedule and disposition of the heat shield root cause investigation. The independent review team would weigh in on the root cause and the corrective actions recommended in the summer, which will be pivotal. If it is okay to continue preparing Orion for launch, then later in the year, probably closer to the fall or in the fall, delivery of Orion to exploration ground systems is also a huge milestone. And somewhere in there, assuming it's okay to continue, SLS would begin to be stacked on the mobile launcher. The timing of pretty much everything from early July onwards is uncertain. One Artemis 3 related detail to note this week, SpaceX confirmed that 15 is the number of tanker launches needed for a Starship HLS landing mission, at least for the time being. Kathy Leaders gave a talk on May 14th at a development conference in Harlington, Texas, which is in the Boca Chica area. In the question and answer session after her presentation on the status of Starbase and Starship, she noted that figure while discussing the rapidly expanding infrastructure at Starbase and future plans to support a high tempo of Starship launches there and from the Kennedy Space Center Cape Canaveral area in Florida. That number could change again. SpaceX is still in a prototyping phase with the Starship design and have started phasing in another set of design changes. That could be a factor, but what is learned from on-orbit propellant transfer demonstration flights could also be a factor in revising the number of tankers needed. For now, 15 tankers would need to be launched from Starbase in Florida to a Starship Depot vehicle in Earth orbit. The Starship HLS vehicle would launch somewhere in that sequence and be refueled from the depot in order to perform the crewed lunar landing demo as a part of Artemis III which would see the vehicle perform the transfer from Earth orbit to the Gateway orbit, and then make a full round trip from there to the surface of the Moon and back. On Artemis III, Orion will rendezvous and dock with Starship in the Gateway orbit, also known as a Near Rectilinear Halo Orbit, or NRHO. Two of the four astronauts will transfer to Starship for the trip down to the surface, 
and approximately one week stay on the moon, and then launching back to rendezvous and dock with Orion. SpaceX is also getting ready for a fourth flight test of the system a little over a year after the first flight test, and a little less than three months after the last one. Leaders said that the current forecast was to receive a launch license sometime after the Memorial Day weekend holiday here in the United States, somewhere between there and the beginning of June. Thanks as always for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative.